Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In our series on History 102, we're going to continue with the New World, New World Part 2, where we talk about slavery, economics, and racism in the New World. This is one of the more depressing topics that we're going to talk about. This can be triggering, so I kind of want to say that now. We're going to deal with slavery and genocide, and we're not going to go into... Um, we're going to keep a 30,000 foot view, but we are going to talk about millions of people being captured, transported, sold, carted off to, across an ocean and then put to work if they were lucky. If they were unlucky, even worse things happened to them. And so this can be a hard, it's a hard episode to do. It's a hard episode for me to talk about. It could be very much a hard episode for you to listen to or engage with. So take care, be safe. So, but the whole episode is kind of acknowledges that terrible things happen to people of color in this class. All right, I'm going to give us three seconds. Okay, here we go. So in left off, the Native Americans were dying due to disease. 95% of them died in the New World. That is a one of the great die-offs of life on Earth, along with the dinosaurs and the is there a Precambian die-off? But that left a problem. Who's going to work the sugar plantations? Who's going to mine the silver mines? White people aren't going to do it. Europeans aren't going to do it. And so the answer they came up with was African slavery. And this replaces one humanitarian disaster, the genocide and death of Native Americans with another humanitarian disaster, the mass cattle chattel slavery. Chattel slavery, C H A T T E L, of African humans. Now, if you were to take my class, we would watch a movie called Atlantic Slave Trade in Two Minutes. And what it does is it shows all of the acknowledged or known ships that are going to sail from West Africa to the New World bringing slaves. And it's going to show you just how much there is. And just how much when the British take over, it explodes. And so we can't do that. I can't show a video within a video on YouTube. So, um, but if you type in, if you go and search Atlantic slave trade in two minutes, it's a uh, one that's kind of a, the, um, front image is a, um, kind of a, a green, a grayish green of a map. And that's the one you want. So what happens and how does it happen from 1520, the, the capture of Mexico, the conquest of Mexico and the destruction of the Aztecs to 1650. Cause we, cause we start with 1520 because the period before that from 1492 to 1520 is this, there's not a lot of Europeans. They're figuring it out. They're, they're oppressing the Caribs of the Caribbean. Um, there's no yet real sugar industry, though it's starting. Maybe um, the plants just haven't grown as much, you know. So there's not a lot of like reason to be in America. And then the conquest of Mexico just brings in tons of silver and gold. And suddenly that. The kings are going to have to stay. Europeans are going to have to stay because now everyone wants to get rich. Cortes became the richest man in Spain. 
1520 and the sacking of Tenochtitlan and the destruction of Aztec and Toltec cultures really begins something new, a new phase. Um, and what we get from 1520 to 1650 is the slave trade. Spain and Portugal need slaves for mining and for sugar. Remember, there's the, the Potosi, the literal mountain of silver in Bolivia. There's the sugar in the Caribbean and the sugar in Brazil. So we have 130 years of this. From 1650 to 1715, the other European countries on the Atlantic get into the fray. England, France, France and the Dutch enter into the fray. Haiti, for example provides 25% of the French crown's income by 1789. That's how wealthy, that's one half of one island, and it was providing 25% of the French king's income. That's insane, but that's how much sugar was worth. And England, France, and the Dutch don't have land. They don't have a lot of people, and they're latecomers. So the land that they do get isn't worth very much. And they've got the problem that the Spanish are there first. So they have the guns. They have the population. And so the few, what you start is piracy. Constant war. Trying to find a foothold. Trying to find a place. An, un, an uninhabited island. Or you, what, the, what the English will do is capture Jamaica. And make that into, and Barbados into their massive sugar plantations but what we have from 1615 to 1715 is piracy this is pirates of the caribbean if you have been to walt disney world you have been on this ride this is what this is the time period that ride takes place in captain jack sparrow all that and constant warfare even if there's peace in europe in the new world there is warfare there's piracy there's warfare it is you are beyond politics you know, no peace beyond the main is the, is the saying, but it was like in the new world, it is a Hobbesian world. Everyone is at war with everybody else. And what we see by 1715 is the decline of Spanish and Portuguese empires. The Portuguese declined first. In fact, the Dutch will, will s absorb much of their, um, Asian empire and the Spanish will be exhausted by the end of the war of Spanish succession that ends in 1715. So from 1715 on, we have Britain, we have the British, we have England, who wins the war of Spanish succession against the French and the Spanish, takes over the monopoly of the slave trade, takes over lots of islands in the West Indies. The British could not conquer Mexico or the Andean mines. They're too far away. There's too many... Um, Spanish people who were loyal to Spain, you, the British just couldn't do it. There's a couple of attempts by Europeans between 1715 and 1900 to do so, and they lose every time. And what we see is the rise of tobacco and later rice in North America after 1715. Remember, in 1609, um, white people show up in Virginia in... 1620, white people show up in New England, and in 1619, the first Africans are brought in as slave workers in Virginia. So the sugar doesn't really work even in Virginia. It's not tropical enough, and there's no sugar up in New England. And so what happens in British North America is the rise of tobacco. There's no gold, by the way, because it's all river estuaries in Virginia. There's nothing there. You'd have to go to find anything in, in the earth. You'd have to go up into West Virginia, you know, and there's just too, too hard to get up there, too far to go. So you get the rise of tobacco and later rice. 1715 also sees the industrialization of the sugar trade, which even makes more money, which equals more power, which equals more money. And you have a massive surge in the Atlantic slave trade. Industrialization, just like it will do for American slavery, instead of ending slavery, increases it. Because the demand 
the, the machines work all the time. So you have the demand for labor. You need cheap labor. And so rather than replacing humans, a lot of times what the machines do is just make work worse for humans. And so suddenly industrialization, which we already talked about is happening, but now it can, it can really take off is with the, with the, you know, invention of factories and, and what will happen, what we'll talk about when we do industrialization, just, a, it's a massive surge in the Atlantic slave trade. So what are the justifications for the slave trade? The first is we need workers. It's, it's the first is it's a solution to a problem and we can't get them anywhere else. European peasants won't come and the other kingdoms like the Portuguese tried to get Chinese slaves and the Qing marched an army and kicked their butt. India the same way. The Mughals are not going to allow Indians to be captured and taken off in mass numbers. And so this is also true in the parts of Africa that have kingdoms, the Sahel, Ethiopia, Egypt, like the Europeans went there too and said, oh, we will take the, and they got their asses handed to them. So they need workers and they can't get them from Europe and they can't get them from China, India, the Middle East, which has the Turks because the kingdoms are too tough or the, the imperial parts of Africa. So you have to get them from the non-imperial parts of Africa. Two, Africa had slavery already. It was a simple exchange of goods. The system exists. You could show up at an African port, at a European African port, and buy slaves. They were there. There was a market. Africa slavery existed. So for Europeans, hey, it was just a simple exchange of goods. I give you some money, you give me this person. Not a big deal. So that made it easier. Now, you should understand, because we're talking about slavery in Africa, what slavery in Africa looked like was Islamic slavery, was Roman slavery. It was the capture of people to work because they had more land than they have people. Africa is large, it's big. And there's a lot of land and not enough people. And so, warfare, one of the goals was you capture people to work for you so that you made more money. The idea of this is one, um, you could have killed them, so working for you is actually better. But two, is it doesn't really apply to the kids. It, it may not apply to the women. The women could be married off, and once they're married off, they're no longer slaves. The children could should be incorporated into the tribe, into the nation, into the kingdom. This is a form that the Romans have of manumission. Now, it's not this straightforward, it's not this simple, but the idea that you would have slaves forever and that one slave would be a descendant of another slave, that would be a descendant of another slave. Just that's not how this worked. It was a punishment for losing a war. But that's what war looked like. That's what slavery looked like back to the Babylonians. People were needed for work. There weren't enough people. There was plenty of land. What the Europeans will create is something totally, totally different. And we will get into why and how and what the justifications were. But you should understand this because what I get is people go, oh, well, the Africans already had slavery. They were barbarians. And go, no, they're, they, yeah, they, no, they're not barbarians because one, they're jacked into the cultural and economic trade routes of the world. They are as civilized as anybody else in the world. In fact, their West African kingdoms, East African kingdoms are well, well older than, than their European counterparts. 
you know, Timbuktu was a great city when London was still, you know, ill, disgusting. So get rid of the, the racism. The second thing is they go, oh, well, you know, it's, 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 it's slavery, 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 slavery. No, there's different kinds of slavery. Now, in all slavery, you were reduced from a person to a machine. That is true. In all slavery, people are property. They are a machine. But what that meant is different. Could you become free? Could you make an income? Is different. So, you, so Africa has slavery. And for the Europeans, that was easy to jack into. You could just show up, buy some slaves. So when, when you watch that movie, the two minutes, the African slave trade in two minutes, you see how slow it starts. Well, that's how that was working. Ships would show up in Africa and they'd buy some African slaves and they put them on a boat and they'd go to the new world and see if they could sell them. Three, Africans were not Christian and thus in European eyes, not civilized. Thus, it's justified. It's the crusader spirit. They're not Christians. See, Christians can't own other Christians as slaves. That goes back to the Romans. That's why slavery died out in Catholic Christian Europe. Even though the, the Vikings practiced it, and then the Vikings became Christian, and then they stopped doing it. But that's why the Catholics did it against the Slavs. Slavs means slave. The Vikings and the, the Swedes and the Germans would attack the Russians, the Russian Slavic peoples, and the Polish Slavic peoples and turn them into slaves. And the, the Swedish Vikings would sell them to the, to the Arabs on the other side of the Black Sea. Or the Turks. But the idea was the Africans weren't Christian, so you could enslave them. Four, Africa sucks. According to white people, it's hot. It's got diseases. You people are working for nothing. Working in America will be much better. That was their attitude. That Africa sucked. Why? Because Africa was bad to white people. Because you couldn't go into the interior. You would die. It was too hot. It was too diseased. White people did not have immunities. And here I'm using white people, meaning the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, the Dutch, the English. Any of these people who will go to West Africa could not go into the interior. Malaria alone, yellow fever, the mosquito diseases would kill them off. So to them, Africa was terrible. North Africa, where the, where the Berbers and the Arabs are, that was nice. That coastal land that Greeks and Romans inhabited, that was nice. But then you got the Sahara and all right in the Sahara, you get some people who just love the desert and that's fair. And then you got to, to the temperate regions of the Sahel and okay, that's Sahel H uh, S A H E L. That's a grassland that goes from Western to Eastern Africa straight across. We talked about that in our cooks tour, but then South of that you're in tropical Africa. And that is just, there's nothing in Europe like that. So to white people, to Europeans, Africa sucked and the Americas were better. And five, slavery will teach slaves how to be civilized. It's good for them. The Europeans are actually doing Africans a favor. We'll teach them to read and write. Uh, no, you actually won't. We'll teach them Christianity. Okay, especially those Old Testament, listen to your master parts. We're not going to teach them Moses, who frees people from slavery. We're going to keep that part kind of secret. We'll make them European in dress and in values and in appearance, our little brown and black brothers. That's nice. That was a nice dream. It's never going to happen. Except in the odd exception that justifies the lack of exceptions for everybody else. But that, I have to tell you, it is still 
on my Twitter feed, I will run into the racists who will say, hey, living in Africa, you know, which would you rather be, in America or in Africa? Like, uh, be in your homeland, you know, rather than uh, enslaved. It's not really much of a question. And you got people who are like, oh, we made black people better. Like, no, you didn't. No. What, what, what's this? What first? What's this we? And second, like, no. It was all justification that never had any follow through. This brings us to one of the more tragic moments. A debate. Literally a debate. And I'm going to pronounce this wrong and I'm, I'm going to try to do it right. The... I hate, once you think about it, you you kind of screwed up the the Valadolid the Valadolid debate V A L L A D O L I D Valado Valado Valadolid Valadolid debate V A L L A D O L I D debate I I I say it with no flavor I'm not Latin enough. So, but we have a debate in Spain. Spanish King Charles I. Charles V in Germany. He's king of Germany and Spain at the same time. He is worried his soul. He's worried about his soul. Because the, under his watch, genocide is happening in the new world of the Native Americans. Slavery is starting in Africa. The slave trade is beginning. And he kind of worries that, well, maybe this is bad. What? Because this is still, remember, it's 15, 20, 30, 40, 50. It is still a religious time when you, especially kings, died and met their maker and had to justify themselves. And most people went to hell. Remember, most people go to hell for a while. Dante's Inferno. So Charles is worried that he's going to be blamed for all of this stuff. And so he calls an academic debate together and goes, you tell me, what should we do? How should we treat the Amera Indians? Are they people or are they not? We know they're not Christian, but are they people? Can they become Christian? And if they become Christian, are they like us? And the second question, which is less important in this debate, the first one is, is really about the American Indian. But the second question is, should slavery exist in the new world? What do we do with the Native Americans? And should we have slavery? And that's where Las Casas, Patalomeo Las Casas, a Dominican priest who is horrified by the conquistadors. He went to the new world thinking bringing Christianity to the natives would be a good thing. And then saw how they did it, how the conquistadors did it. They're conquerors. It's right there in the name. We give it a nice Spanish title, but they're crusading conquerors. So they murdered and raped lots of people. And he talks about, he gets up and he says, King, Charles, Carlos, and he talks about human rights. And he talks about hashtag all souls are equal. And he means all souls are equal. He's not hashtagging it as like, hey, you can't be like Native, Native lives matter. Native lives do matter. His whole thing is they have souls. The natives have souls. They matter. All souls are equal. And Jesus is watching what we do. Jesus gave us this profound privilege of being Spanish, of being white, of being Europeans, of being Christian. Yes, Las Casas is talking about white privilege because he viewed being a European as a privilege. And he says, these other people deserve that. Now, possibly it's, it's a statement which I don't think it's certain but it's possibly he came from a Jewish converted family, converso family that stayed in Spain after 1492 because they, quote, converted to Christianity. Now, he's 
a Dominican priest, so he's clearly not Jewish anymore. But it's also notice it's 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 an insult against him. Oh, he's he only cares about all these other people because he's secretly Jewish. Right? He's not really a conquistador. He's not really one of us. You know. But he's in some ways the inventor of universal human rights. He's one of the first arguers about it. And that's why this debate hurts my soul as a professor as a historian because it's the moment it's literally a moment where the spanish king is like should we be terrible people or should we be better people and those moments don't happen so often usually it's like society falls into it they do it because the they're at, one step is into another into another into another It's not an accident, but it's not, the end is not where you expected the end to be and you end up there. So, so here's this moment in history where it's like literally that we can live in two different timelines and Las Casas is like, we can live in a timeline where we're equal, where we're all Christians. And Septuveda, De Septuveda, is the arguer on the other side of the debate. He says, yes, yes, Casas says, Casas is right. The Bible says all of that. The he, er, all, chapter and verse, it says yes. And we could go into the Romans and yes. And we could do Theodosius and yes. I'll give you, I give you all of that. Casas is totally right. And then he whips out the money machine and goes, but you're entitled, Mr. King, to 20% off the top. You're entitled to 20% gross. Now, he takes his, licks his fingers, opens up the accounting books and goes, let's talk about how much money that is. And sugar money was an ocean of cash. And silver was a literal mountain in Bolivia. We call it Potosi, P-O-T-O-S-I, with an accent on the I, but it, you could call it Silver Mountain. 180 tons of gold, 16 tons of silver will be extracted out of the New World between 1500 and 1700. So we could be nice to the natives and let them do whatever frolic and go about their lives and we could let all the slaves go free and hey let's ship them back to africa no problem or carlos rex you could build the escorial the greatest palace in europe you could defeat the protestants you could save the catholic church with the inquisition you could reunite europe by defeating france you could save europe from islam by stopping the turkish invasion of germany you could be generally super duper awesome in history. Alexander, Caesar, Marcus Aurelius, Charlemagne, Carlos Rex. That's what you could be. And the king looks at that looks at all that money but 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 slavery is bad jesus says so remember who jesus is talking to jesus is not talking to christians he is not talking to europeans he is talking to a jewish population in judea that has been conquered that is powerless When he talks about the meek will inherit the earth, he's talking about people who were conquered by the Romans. He's not talking about the Romans. He's not talking to the Romans. That's Paul. That's later on. Jesus is talking to people who are oppressed, who are conquered, who are enslaved.
And so his entire message is heaven will set you free. If you follow the scripture, it will set you free. Follow me. I am the way, the path, the light. So 1,500 years of European ethics says slavery is bad. Christians cannot own another Christian as a slave. All Christian souls matter because they do. Now, that doesn't mean we are all equal. That doesn't mean we all treat each other the same. It's not communism in Europe. It'd be better if it meant that, that all souls were the same. European European economics... And politics has a hierarchy. But a peasant does matter. Their soul matters. Just because they're a Christian. They are are entitled, as Jefferson will write, as Locke will put, will write first, life, liberty, and property. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. By just being Christians... They're entitled to that. And so the king is struggling with this, but the king likes that money, man. Likes that money. And so problem one, the Catholic Church wants to convert Africans and Charles can't say no. He needs the Catholic Church. He's got the Protestant Reformation going on in Germany and the, and the, the, the Netherlands where the Dutch are. He's got to convert. He's got to get rid of the Jews and the Muslims who are left in Spain. He's got wars to fight against the Turks. He cannot anger the Catholic Church in Italy, in Rome. And they want to, and they're powerful in Spain. They're the largest landowner in Spain. And they want to convert the Africans. And the natives. And Charles can't say no. Two so Africans come from the new from Africa to the New World. They get off the boat. They're going to be sold. Well, there's priests there who say, hey, have you heard of Jesus? And they say, no. And they say, well, you know, if you love Jesus, you don't have to be a slave. And these Africans say, wait, if I love your Jesus, I can go home? I could be a citizen? I could be not a slave. That's how this works. And so African converts will want to go back to Africa. The first thing they'll do is say, I'm a Christian. Yes, of course I love Jesus. What do I need to do? Well, you need to eat this bread. All right, I got you. You need to drink this wine. No problem. You need to say you love Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm with you. Can I be free and go home now? Hey, I'll go back home. Tell other people about Jesus. Then you won't have to make us slaves in the first place. If we, we cut this whole part out. The whole middle passage. We're going to cut that part out. Y- you just leave us alone. How about you just leave us alone? Right? Wouldn't that be awesome? We all be Christians. And you're like, that's crazy. No, it's not. That's Ethiopia. Remember, Ethiopia was Christian. It's Orthodox Christian. But when the Portuguese show up, they show up and they're like, we have come to conquer you. In the name of Jesus. And they're like, oh, Jesus. You are you like Jesus too? We've liked him for a long time. And they're like, in Portuguese, are like, no, 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 no. You don't know. No. Jesus, who died for, uh, for our sins. Yes. Three days later, resurrected. Yeah, got it. Got the book. Here's the book. Got churches. Look, we got crosses. Got the whole thing. And like, well, you wait, wait. But you're in Africa. And like, yes yes, we're in Africa and we like Jesus because we were tied through Egypt to the Roman Empire probably better than you were in Portugal, or at least at the same level because you're at the end of Europe and we were on the Nile. So congratulations. We're brothers. We're like cousins. We are brothers in Christ. Hallelujah. And the Portuguese are like, shit, we can't take you as slaves. We can't conquer you. And then the Ethiopians are like, you know who we're fighting? We're fighting the Muslims down the coast. How about you help us with that? We could set up factories. We can help you. You help us. We help you. And we get to fight the Muslims. And you know who Christians love to fight? And the Portuguese are like, Muslims. 
but you're in Africa, so we can't make you slaves. And Ethiopians are like, slaves? Uh, yeah, no, because the Muslims have been making us slaves for like a thousand years. So no, we don't get to be slaves. And the Portuguese are like, oh, okay. And they don't enslave the Ethiopians. It's the craziest thing. Why? Because they were Christian. And they could prove that they were Christian. Was it the same Christianity? No. But did it, but were, was it, was it still Christianity? Yeah. And so problem two is African converts are going to want to go back to Africa. They are not going to want to stay and work for the Europeans. And they're certainly not going to want to do the backbreaking work of mining, sh of doing the mines, mining silver, or working in the sugar plantations. F that, man. First rule is going to be, I'm a Christian. You can't make me do this work. That's crazy talk. You do it. And the Europeans are going to go, I don't want to do it because I'm a Christian. I shouldn't have to do this backbreaking labor. So the whole point of having the slavery would be lost if you allow Africans to convert. But you can't stop Africans from converting. Problem three, Europeans need workers and they'll lose their African labor and there's no replacement and they will lose all the investment in buying and selling slaves in the first place. That entire infrastructure will wither. The entire sugar industry will decline. And so Charles, who's looking at all this money, is like faced with this problem of, I can make a ton of money, literally tons of money, or I can treat the natives and Africans like people. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to I'm going to treat them like conquered people and slaves because I need the money. But this adds all of these other problems because he can't keep the Catholic Church out. And so how do you deal with the ethics? And so what European capitalism demanded in 1550 was one, a massive source of cheap labor which could not say no to working. They either had to agree to work or could be forced to work. That was the problem with European peasants. You couldn't force them to work. You couldn't, you know, just murder them willy-nilly. But the wealth of kings and the companies who are paying taxes to the king demands labor. European capitalism demands cheap labor labor if you have ever worked for a minimum wage job you know this if you've ever worked for a pri rather than a company but for a private individual like a, a dude who owns a store you know a coffee shop or whatever you know that's a problem because you'll get a raise of like 10 cents because every raise you get comes out of his pocket Small business owners are terrible much of the time, or at least in my experience, maybe they're better now. I haven't worked for a small business owner for a long time. I work for public, the public good. I look for, for states and counties, the government that doesn't have a profit motivation. But I have worked for private individuals. I've dug holes for pools back in the day. I've worked retail. I've worked in entertainment. I've worked for small business. And you would get a 10 cent raise after a year. You're like, what does 10 cents freaking buy me an hour? Nothing. And they would give it to you as if they were giving you the Eucharist. Here's this blessing. Why? Because that was 10 cents. And you saw it in their eyes when they agreed to pay you a raise. That they're like, I'm 10 cents poorer because of you. And so what do you get? You get massive turnover. I stayed three years at a job. Not only was I the last one left from the original group that I, I was hired when I was the youngest employee, when I was the, the newest employee, by three years, not only, I was the only one left. We had cycled through two other generations. I was granddad. 
I was 20 years old and called granddad. Because no one could remember not only the people I worked with, but the people who replaced those people or the people who replaced those people. So my stories were like, okay, granddad, back in the day, you know, everybody was gone multiple times over. So my problem, right? I don't know when to leave, but European capitalism demanded labor. It had to come from somewhere. It can't come from the European peasant. And it can't come from the natives. They're dying or died out. It can't come from Asia. So there's only two solutions. One, you pay wages high enough that you can attract labor. You could attract immigrants. You can attract labor. But that's a cycle of constantly paying more money to keep them. It's a crappy job in crappy conditions. They're going to want more money. Or two, people who can't say no. And so what is the solution to this? Racism. The solution to these problems, the solutions to Africans wanting to go back if they convert to Christianity, the problem of ethics of religious ethics in, in, in Europe is racism is to invent an all new kind of thing that human value was not tied to culture, which was traditional, but to skin color. And that is totally new. The Romans cared. If you were a Roman, you were a Roman or you weren't, you were Greek or you weren't, you were Babylonian or you weren't. You were Persian or you weren't. Your culture mattered. Romans don't care what color you are. You had East uh, you had East African black people, Ethiopians. And you had West African black people, uh, Numidians, Nubians. And that's kind of how, like... So when they write about, oh, he was a, you know, black as coal or whatever they may have described these people as, it's a curiosity. It has nothing to do with their value. We have African kings in Egypt, the 25th, 26th dynasty. Racism is invented in the 1500s and it's invented by white people. That doesn't mean everybody got along. That doesn't mean people of different skin colors didn't get along. That doesn't mean there's not a hierarchy. But there is not a value put on your skin. A black Greek was a Greek. A black Roman could walk the earth saying, um, Civitas Romanus, I am a Roman citizen. And the law protected him or her. Just like Italian. Just like Gaulic, white, you know, I, the whitest of Romans. Remember, the Romans aren't necessarily white. They lived on the sunny Italian peninsula. They mixed with all kinds of people. So. So the olive skin of European of Italians is, you know, famous and desired. That came from mixing. That came from environment and mixing. So. But we have racism. Your value as a person is now tied to your skin color. So you could be a black Christian. It doesn't matter. You are black. That happens to be a Christian. You are white Christian. That color comes first. It doesn't matter if you become a Christian or you speak European languages or study at Cambridge. Your skin color equals your worth. What does this do? What effects does this have? 
Why? Why do this? Why invent racism? One of the scourges, one of the worst things ever invented. Why? That's haunting us still. 600 years later. First, it's natural. Skin color can't change. So the idea was, hey, God just made some people better. It's science. It's natural. Uh, black people are just worse than white people. White people are just better than everybody else. Hey, there you go. And you get people like Charles Murray still writing books that white people are just naturally smarter than black people. Here, I gave them all a test. And white people did better. Of course, I'm a white dude giving a test to other white people who live in the same cultural world with the same cultural language that I live in. And so, wow, they did better. I remember um, on NPR, National Public Radio, a complaint from a teacher. And this like blew my mind and changed my mind on standardized tests. And she was in like Miami. She was a, a Latin, Latinx woman. Uh, well, it would be Latina woman, but I, I don't want to claim her gender. Um, so let's, but it was a woman teacher, Latina woman teacher in Miami doing a roundtable discussion on NPR about standardized tests. And like, it was like one of those like, Americans are American kids and education. Are they doing worse than China? And, oh, what could we do better? And, and she said, the standardized tests don't work. And he went, what do you mean it don't? And the white host went, what do you mean you don't work? No, she did not accusing. Like, you know, as part of the debate. How could you say that? How can you say the standardized test doesn't work? And she goes, well, have you read the questions? I deal with Latin students mostly immigrants, Spanish-speaking students from Latin and South America. And our test had questions on tobogganing. These are kids who have never seen snow. What do they know about a toboggan? And they're going to read a paragraph on a toboggan and tobogganing and wearing mittens and scarves and... They've never seen snow. How can they answer any of those questions? And my mind went, because she's exactly right. And yet you have people who look at those things and go, oh, look at those Spanish kids. They're just doing worse. Well, of course they're doing worse. They can't answer those questions. But this is one of those justifications. The justification is that your skin color can't change. So this makes it generational. And it means, hey, God just wanted white people to be better. Can't argue with that. It's science. Now, we'll talk about science later on. And that will be a problem. But they will claim this is science. Two, it's obvious. I can see from a half a mile away, right? I can, the end of the block. Right? I can see if you're white or you're black. I can't tell if you're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. I can't tell your culture. I can't tell your level of civilization. You can't tell a Christian from a non-Christian by sight. Now, but you could tell a black African from a white European from a distance. So you automatically know people's caste. Are you free or are you not? Are you a white person I have to treat as an equal in the new world, at least until I know what level you are and what level I am? Am I a lord and you're a peasant, a merchant? Are we both merchants? Like, I have to treat you as an equal until I know I'm better than you or I'm worse than you. But the black person that I see from half a mile away, I know what they are by sight from far away. So that is one of the, that's one of the problems with policing in America. With black African Americans being turned, pulled over is the assumption is right from the beginning. 
You are a black person. You are dangerous to me, the white cop. And so violence escalates very quickly because of this part too. Sight. Three, it's continuous. It's generational. It's self-perpetuating because African people, black people who have children will have black children. Now, it gets more complicated than that. I know, I know, I know. But, and we could go into genetics and the, the nice little box and all that, but the idea is two black people, who two Africans who have a child are going to have a black, a black child. Well, that's a new slave. So it's self-perpetuating. It's self-generating. And in, a, in the United States, you get the one-drop rule. So even if you look white, if you have any black African ancestors, you're black. You're African. And then we get the concept of passing. So we get the one drop, quote, rule, but we also get the passing rule. So it doesn't matter if your great, great grandfather happened to be a black person, you're black, no matter what you look like. And so now you get passing. What do you look like, not to yourself, but to other people? people and so you get now you have this this contested zone of who's white you get mixed race folk right because what what are white men going to do with their slave women they're going to rape them they're going to rape them and it's just part of it i yeah i don't even know what to do with the trauma of that Oh, we're going to talk about the trauma of that. This is a terrible lecture, and I'm sorry. But we get into passing. You're white if other white people claim you're white, accept you as white. You are what other people say you are. That's passing. Now, whether you want to pass or don't want to pass, that's a whole different thing. But racism dictates you are not what you think you are. You are not what you say you are. You are what other people say you are. This is kind of how countries will work. We'll talk about the Haiti and Haiti's revolution. Racism plays a big part in that, and it's the same idea. A country gets to be a country if other countries accept it as a country. So I am a white person because other people say I'm a white person. Now, I could be Irish and I could be Italian and we have no painter's book about how, you know, the history of white people about how immigrants become, quote, white. Because when when Thomas Jefferson is right about all men are created equal, he means a very small group of people. Very small. He did not mean my ancestors, even though one of my ancestors was here on the continent. He did not mean him. He was Irish. He was Catholic. He was a laborer. He was not included in that all men are created equal. But as generations go on, he will be included or his kids will be included. And there's a lot of different reasons for this, partly laid out in now Painter's book. Um... But it's the idea of passing. You are what other people say you are. What are the results? The results are it invents whiteness as an inverse to blackness. This didn't exist before. This didn't matter before. But now you have to invent what is white? Who is white? And the answer is, well, it's not black. Are the Irish people white? Are the Italians white? Who's white? Are Catholics white? What about East Asian peoples? What about South Asian peoples? Do they count? You know, but the answer is, well, they're not black. But what are they? And there's a question, and it's a continuously contested question. Who gets to be white? And how do they get to be white? And that's explored in Nell Painter's book, A History of White People. Nell Painter is an African-American sociologist at Princeton, I believe she was. Um, and it's well worth investigating. It's well worth reading. Um, her, her basic thesis, and I'm, I'm doing it 
injustice by summing it up this way, but it's it's the, uh, her idea is that um, in America there is a racial floor, and that floor is black people, is African American peoples. So immigrants can come in and quote become white. Why can they become white? Why can they go from being oppressed? Maybe not as, and this is Eric Foner, who is a famous, famous historian of Reconstruction. His book will blow your freaking mind. His book on Reconstruction. Read the 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 edited one, not the full. Until you're in graduate school, you don't need to read the, the full, massive one, unless you just want to feel depressed about how terrible America is. But and how many chances we had to be better. But Eric Foner's idea, argument, counter argument to the book is, if I'm remembering correctly, that, yeah, there's oppression, but that's not what was hope. My, my Italian ancestors, my Irish ancestors got treated badly. They still didn't get treated as badly as black people. And that's probably true, I would go with. I mean, that's systemically, it's definitely true. Despite the Irish and the Italian ghettos, you know, there is a movement. I, you know, there is a privilege. It's hard to argue. My life, my generational life tells you this. My grandfather from Italy got off a boat at seven years of age, had nothing, nothing. Could you imagine being a seven-year-old who doesn't speak the language trying to live in New York? A seven-year-old. He beget my father. My father begot me. I'm a white person. I'm Italian. I'm Irish. I'm married to an Italian Irish person. But I live in the suburbs that are 85 to 95 percent white. I have a I'm a college professor where most people are white. I went to graduate school where almost all the people I went to graduate school and we were liberals at a liberal place. Almost everybody was white. And so I'm white and I live in a mostly white world. That's what happened in three generations. How? Well, I don't know. But part of it is people treat me as they treated my father as a white person, as they treated my grandfather. It might be World War II and the GI Bill made them. But my grandfather went from not acceptable as a citizen of the United States, as a as a possible terrorist to me being a college professor. And African-American folks haven't been able to make that transition for the most part. And that's what this book is trying to in investigate. Why? Why are immigrants able to become, quote, white? And her, Nell Painter's argument is because there's always black people. So you could always say, I'm not black. And get incorporated into white privilege. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not a sociologist. Uh, but I think highly enough of the theory to cite it and think you should read it. Give it a shot. There are other theories out there. Two. As a result, it creates a gradient of color, which makes a gradient of value. White is good. But that means darker is worse. And so there are lots of different shades of color, of black, of white. Remember, my Italian ancestors, olive-skinned people, right? My Irish ancestors going to be pretty pale. Maybe, maybe not. Because there's black people in, in Ireland from the Roman periods. And we see this, this gradient of color in apartheid, in South African apartheid, which created scientific, quote, unquote, quote, quote, air quotes, scientific racism of what they called coloreds, of people who weren't white, but weren't black. Those were, quote, coloreds. And so they had to figure out, well, how black is somebody and how white is somebody if you're a mix? Like, what percentage are you? And he would do things like measure parts of your body. You know, measure the bridge of your nose. 
because white people have a narrower bridge and black people have a broader bridge, you know, that kind of crap. But that's what they did to justify this. And so you get colorism or whitewashing, the using of lighter skinned people to represent darker folk. As I'm doing this, there's a, the brouhaha about In the Heights using light skinned Puerto Ricans to play Dominicans. Now, there are light skinned Dominicans, but Dominicans are also known as being, especially New York Dominicans, as being fairly darker in their skin tone. Why? 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 In a movie, in a in a movie about a play about a neighborhood of Dominicans, is the only person of who's black, the African American character. Is that the character you couldn't change? You couldn't whitewash. You know, you couldn't get a lighter skin because you're like, oh well, it has to be. And then they took out the song by the father about the racism about the racism he's dealt with and the racism he feels because he doesn't want his daughter hanging out with the black guy who's working for him. And he admits it's, it's racism. I, I don't want that. And I should, it's, it's racism. He knows it's racism because Benny is a perfectly good person. But this is, again, how color replaces culture. And so we're, I'm dealing with this. We're dealing with this right literally now as we speak in the popular culture. Three, it creates fear of the black body, which is what we, <laughs> it's exhausting. What we're dealing with, with Black Lives Matter and police shootings and systematic racism and incarceration. And it's a fear of the black body. It creates so it allows for white violence, white control, and terror, terrorism. Whether it is the KKK or guys marching in Charlottesville that you will not replace us, you know, or, or just a guy or a woman yelling, go back where you came from. Shit, man. That can be said to every fucking one of us. The difference, and it's a major difference, is my ancestors came willingly. They came without money. Some came with some money, being they were refugees. They packed up what they had. Others came as immigrants with nothing. The clothes on their back and whatever might have been in a suitcase, if they carried a suitcase, to start over. They came with a promise. They came not knowing anybody. But they came willingly. Whereas people who were descended from black Africans, from the African slave trade, were incarcerated, were mutilated, were forced, were exported, were sold. This is a big point for both James Baldwin and Malcolm X's in their books, whether you came willingly or not to the new world. Now, this is acknowledged in the racism and the fear that that African peoples did not come willingly. So there is a fear of slavery, of the revolt of the slaves, the constant policing of black behavior, of violence, of terrorism. This is Spartans versus the Helots. This is Romans and dealing with Spartacus. This is the American Confederacy. There is a fear always a fear of the slave owner of the enslaved. And that fear, especially in places where you are outnumbered, is replaced by violence, a constant policing of behavior. The Spartans literally declared war on their own slaves every year to justify murdering them. 
there's the idea that white women must be kept separate from black men to protect white women from miscegenation. The idea is that black men will want white women. Why? Because white women are better than all the other women. So black men will want to rape them, will want to dominate them. There's also the fear that white women will prefer black men, that white men, there's always, remember, part of racism is this inferiority complex. On top of the bravado of I am better than you is also all of this policing, all of this fear that black people are stronger than us. Black people can revolt against us. I can be overthrown. There's a complete lack of confidence. Why do I have to keep white women away from black men? Maybe white women prefer black men. That's To Kill a Mockingbird. That's the court scene. Where what comes out is that the African-American man, the black man, did not attack, even though he's being accused of it, did not attack the white woman. The white woman came to him for attention. We see this, that intermarriage between, especially between white women and black men was illegal in the United States until 1967, until the Loving case. Illegal. In, at least, I think it's by 1967, 11 states, it's still illegal. Barack Obama's, Barack Obama is the first African-American president of the United States in at least 11 states, if not more. His parents' marriage was illegal. His birth was illegal. That's how long we're talking about. We're talking about one generation. We're talking about he has children your age, younger than me. So there's this fear, sexual fear, of what if you allow people to mix. And then there's the exoticism. The exoticism of the female, black female body. That it's magic. It's seductive to white men. It can't be resisted. And so we see this with Sheba. I mean, she's called Sheba for God's sakes in Django Unchained. And she's dressed up. And she's given jewelry and she's drinking champagne and she's got her hair done and she's a slave. But gosh darn it, if she isn't sexualized by Leonardo DiCaprio, slave owner. And so constant rape was, le I mean, Sheba's from the Queen of Sheba. I mean, come on, who, who, who? had children with um, Solomon, king of Jerusalem. And I have a whole video you could go and see on the Queen of Sheba, which is worth watching. But this, this idea that the black female, black body is exotic, magical, seductive, allows for constant rape. Constant rape of black women was legal and acceptable by white society. She's a witch. What am I to do? I couldn't resist her. What this allowed was for a constant violation of black women, control of black families, the use of pregnancy to create more slaves, to humiliate black men, you'd humiliate black men because you'd, you'd suggest violence upon their wives, their daughters, which you could get away with legally if they didn't obey. If you do not do black man what I say, I will subject your wife, your daughter, your sister to violence. So it's a humiliation of black men who cannot protect their kin, their family, and it is to control black male behavior. And so if you're watching the video, I have two, two images of Sally Hemings. One is from a book. The one on the right is from a book written by an African-American woman uh, in 1979. And the one on 
the one on the right is the book and the one on the left with Sam Neill is the movie. And both portray Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson's relationship as a love story. I mean, Sally Hemings, look at this, this, this poster, the true story of a romance between president and slave. Sally Hemings, an American love story, real, an American love story. This is a story that could only happen in America. Bound by slavery, but freed by love. Oh my God. And so the movie is in 2000. And what does that tell us? What does it tell us that the need of writing, talking about Sally Hemings as a love story with Thomas Jefferson, they had seven children together. Or he fathered seven of her children is probably a better way of talking about it. It wasn't together. They were never together. Is the need for white America to whitewash an American hero. It's a forbidden love. He would have married her. He would have legitimized his children if only other people allowed. No, Thomas Jefferson is a rapist. And history has to deal with that. We have to deal with that. This is, this is history. History kills your heroes. You cannot go into history. You cannot be a historian and love anything because it will always take from you that love because you have to deal with complications. Thomas Jefferson is a man who wrote all men are created equal. And then he went home by carriage from Philadelphia, went to his mansion with 500 black people toiling so that he could be one of the richest men in Virginia and then raped a woman who could not say no. By any standard, by any definition we use today, she could not consent. She was owned. Her body was owned. Her sexuality was owned. Her children were owned. She could not say no. This is not a love story because there's no equality. Now, what about the 1979 novel written by an African-American woman? Well, that's the need to empower a black woman, to give her denied dignity, to say this was a relationship and she had the power in it. She wasn't raped. She changed American history through Jefferson. He wanted to limit slavery. He wanted to change because of his relationship with her. It's a need for a black woman to have dignity in a relationship that is very easy to portray, that there is no dignity. That's just violence. But that gets Jefferson off the hook, and I can't abide by that either. I don't know enough about Sally Hemings' day-to-day -day life. I don't know. I just, I do not know. But she was owned. She had no freedom. She was never freed in her lifetime. Her children were not freed. He did not break the bonds of ownership. Thomas Jefferson is a great American man. He is also a terrible person. And we have to deal with that. Because that is America. That a man who can say all men are created equal and then think nothing nothing about using the body of another person is America. He did not think of her as all men, as human. He didn't. No more than he thought about my Irish ancestor as human. As deserving those things. He didn't. And we have to deal with that. That's what we do in history. Because we're still dealing with it. With our sore feet from our protest in the Black Lives Matter. Last year. We're still dealing with this. 
And every time we say, oh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings was a love story. It was a love. No, we're just washing it over. We're placating it. We're making it okay. Instead of calling it what it is. Which is a horror. That doesn't mean Sally Hemings didn't have dignity. Of course she did. She did what she needed to do. I don't know her biography, and I'm going to give her every, every moment of saying whatever she did, whatever she felt, was the best of a horrible situation that no human being should ever be in. But by no standard that we use today can Sheba in Django Unchained be considered a willing participant in the system. Nor could Sally Hemings. So, so what are the effects? 15 million people are removed from Africa. America gets rich and Africa becomes poor. Just no way about this. Brazil and Caribbean become African. They gain an African culture hegemony with white accents. You go to the Caribbean today and it's African. It's black. Black music. Black food. Black waves of, of, of culture. It's black. It's not American Indian. And it might speak in English. It might have European accents to it. But you get food or the religious concept of voodoo, which is this combination of African polytheism with Christianity. You get the songs and the music. That's all African. Africa moved out of Africa and took over the Caribbean and Brazil. So African culture spread. The world is more African in 2000 than it was in 1500. America, which in North America, I mean, United States, which got 5% of the African slaves, you have an entire economy and society affected by the slave trade. Banks, trade, shipping, insurance, housing, guns, all of it is affected by it. You get it all in order to maintain and perpetuate the slave trade. You get high violence. Americans' willingness to use violence all the time. Our love in movies of violence. Our love in books of violence. Our love of violence is partly because of our slavery in the United States. The caste hierarchy we have a caste hierarchy. Think about how crazy that is. You have a caste hierarchy in a democratic society. A democratic society is supposed to be equal. All people are equal in a democratic society. We do not believe that. Racism means we don't. Jim Crow laws said there is a hierarchy, and yet we are a democratic people. How do you get a caste hierarchy? In a democratic society, a caste hierarchy where, where it's perpetuating generation after generation of who is worth what. How do you get that in a democratic society of equality? Only with high violence, only with massive amounts of violence. And you get the Second Amendment to allow that. The Second Amendment was there to stop poor or slave revolts. It was there to arm white citizens against their slaves, against the poor. Europe, Europe gets rich. It's wars. They, they are going to fight 200, 300 years worth of wars until we get to the French Revolution. And then everything just changes in chaos. And there's wars to, they fight wars to control the slave trade. The British will win. And it will help found British industrialization. The discovery of the new world equals the Bible and the ancients are wrong, which equals a crisis of knowledge. Wait a minute. The, there is no new world in the Bible. There is no new world in the ancients. No Aristotle, no, no uh, Plato talks about the new world. What if they're wrong about other things? 
we get new concept of the natural man. The man in nature. And the idea is to go out and get rich. It breaks the old hierarchy. You can go to America and be different. You can start over. As Hamilton in the Hamilton in New York, you can be a new man. Yeah. Change New York to the new world. In the new world, you can be a new man. For Europeans, as for male Europeans, you can go to America and start over. It's like going to the city for ancient Babylonians or Romans. You can go and be anonymous and you could carve something out. There's this space for you. Not for other people, but for Europeans there was. Yet Africans from all over, from different tribes, different languages, brutalized and violated, created music and culture and food and traditions and family and church. They made European culture blacker despite the racism. There is a mixture of things. They create a whole new world out of the genocide of natives and their own diaspora. The African story in America is one of triumph against the worst of human brutality. For all of those other effects, you get Africans creating an entirely new culture in America. That is a successful culture. That is an emulated culture. So thank you. I know this episode was a little long and I know it's a heavy episode. So thank you for staying, sticking with me. And I'm sorry. <laughs>